Right, I believe um, we're live. So it's uh, Javed Katak here. Um, and we have a panel today uh, of four experts where the, the topic is how can frontier tech, like blockchain, artificial intelligence, the internet of things, and FinTech change our governments, so cities and society. Um, today we've got our, with us uh, Kohei Kohinara, who is the president uh, of the Tokyo chapter of the Government Blockchain Association. Then we've got um, Craig Skeldon, business development manager, Bay Center, the Un University of Edinburgh. We've got Armando Gonzalez, CEO of Ravenpack, and we are expected to be joined shortly by hopefully Edwin Diender, who is the CDXO and VP, Government and Pub Public Sector of Huawei. Um, before I pass over to them, uh, just a couple of words about me and my background. <clears throat> I'll be moderating the panel. Um, so my name is Javed Katak. Uh, my background originally very uh, corporate. I've worked for some of the largest organizations on the planet, uh, initially as a qualified actuary, so helping uh, companies like GlaxoSmithKline and Mark and Spencer, HSBC, etc., manage funds, their pension funds of over six billion pounds. Then went into management consulting, um, helped companies like Thomson Reuters launch uh, some fantastic product offerings. Um, then joined a fintech uh, blockchain based um, startup that had raised five million dollars in an ICO as a CFO. And since then, I have been in the startup and SME sector consulting with a few of my own startups, this properties, I'm the CEO and founder of that, which is a property investment platform, UK FCA registered. And I am um, very focused on using technology to try and actually make a, uh, make a difference uh, in the world and very excited to you know, kind of be operating in this space. Um, so that's about me in a nutshell. Um, the way we will be running the, uh, the, the session today essentially is, so um, initially I'll just pass uh, over to um, uh, our experts and they will introduce themselves, um, talking a little bit about their background and how they believe um, the, the, the frontier tech can impact the world, government, cities, and so on and so forth. And then perhaps after that, we can uh, talk about uh, uh, you know kind of some of the key aspects, tease out some questions, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so with that, um, I would pass on to perhaps first Armando um, to introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Javed. Um, so I'll I'll start by um, telling you a little bit about um, myself and what I do at. Raven Pack. Um, so I'm the CEO and, and co-founder of a company that specializes in big data uh, technologies, specifically for financial markets. And I started my career in, in artificial intelligence and, and big data about 20 years ago, um, perhaps a little bit naive as to what it was and, and how, how it was going to change the world back then. Uh, but with a lot of hope that a lot of things could be built and done um, to, to make our lives easier and better. And so um, I embarked on a, on a mission to, to develop you know, technology that would help us understand language. Right? And that's effectively the idea is to be able to read text, read news, read anything that we write. And because we, we write a lot of it, um, use... To, um, AI to help us process all that information. Um, and one of the first use cases for, for this technology was essentially financial research, where when you think about it, banks and, and large hedge funds, uh, they need to read practically everything that is being said about companies or economies or any specific financial instrument before they decide to invest their money. And Big data uh, specifically has become a very important part of that investment research process where through the use of tools, um, investors are able to understand more so how 
a variety of factors. You know, whether it's a CEO involved in some fraudulent scandal or uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic that will influence the revenues of an entire sector. Um, those pieces of information and making models and making predictions on how these you know, data points will affect assets um, is, is critical. Um, and so I can't imagine a world where um, we, without you know, some form of, of artificial intelligence, um, some, some technologies around natural language processing to try to make sense of everything that is being said around the world about practically anything. Right? We've become, as humans, I think, quite limited now. Um, and every time that we try to make or rationalize what people are saying about a specific topic, all we do is we end up polarizing ourselves because we don't, we no longer have that mental capacity, right, to understand and process all the information that is out there. And when you think about us as individuals or you think about us as communities or, you know, cities, regions, countries, etc., it becomes exponentially harder to make sense of what everyone is saying about all the various topics that affect our lives. And as you can tell, you know, most governments have began taking advantage of these newer technologies um, to try to understand, you know, how social economic or, you know, even social psychological factors um, may be developing and how those will affect, you know, the decisions that, that we make, um, whether it's policies or politics, or it's deciding on whether to open schools during a pandemic or distribute vaccines or any critical decision that, that needs to be made, um, it becomes imperative. You know, to take advantage of these new technologies to try to formulate a more objective opinion about things. And I think, unfortunately, um, despite the existence of a lot of these tools, and while surely many of them are, are still in development um, and, and we're becoming more acquainted with it, um, as a society, I think we still fail to take advantage of them. And we still continue to lead uh, and decide based on rather subjective opinions. Um, or we try to, you know, um, read or understand or use data that supports our own biases, right? You know, something called confirmation bias, right? And what, I, I think it's both, you know, at the same time, we're gonna evolve technologically and we're gonna continue to develop these great tools and Every year we see a significant quantum leap in, in data analysis and data extraction and delivery, but we are walking like turtles when it comes to using it in an effective way, right? And, and I think that it applies both um, to the private sector, less so, but to the public sector, specifically in government and in politics. Um, we, I think, overall fail to rely on these new technologies. Uh, and fail to rely on on big data um, to make you know to make important decisions for our for our constituents. Uh, and at the same time, I think you know we're going to have this let's let's call it a um, a gap you know between what leaders want to do and and the factors that drive them and force them to make you know certain decisions versus what the data is telling you or what the the tools and techniques that we're building can help you find, right? It's like knowing the truth, but you don't want to know it really, or knowing the, knowing the facts, but you're not willing to use them uh, because it doesn't support your own agenda. So I think those those will be questions that we will continue to ask ourselves, and, and these will be you know core challenges that we'll face when it comes to um, leveraging these new technologies. Um, and while, you know, there are, you know, specific issues around the construction of the technologies and specifically in AI, whether ethics need to be embedded in the AI, whose ethics, um, um, as well as, you know, how do we go about programming some of these, you know, robotic processes? Um, I think the challenges still very much remain in, in the use cases and, and the way, you know, at, at the point where, you know, important decisions need to be made. 
um, whether our leaders are ready, you know, to take advantage of them. Um, and at the same time, you know, do so in a rather ethical and legal fashion, right? Without violating privacy or without, you know, affecting or infringing on some of our basic rights. So anyways, just as a kind of general intro, you know, this is what I focus most of my time on um, and my company focuses on building these technologies and, uh, and I'm very excited, you know, with what the future has ahead of us um, and looking forward to hear more about the rest of the panel. Thank you. Um, that is fantastic. Thank you very much, Armand. There's some very interesting thoughts and uh, ideas there. Um, some very interesting questions that um, probably uh, once, you know, we've gone through the introduction round, uh, would like to, you know, kind of touch on. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, so next, I'll pass on to uh, Craig, um, who's the Business Development Manager, um, Bay Center, the University of Edinburgh. Thanks very much, Javid, and uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining the, the discussion this morning. If you're in UK time and elsewhere, if you're from across the world, it's a, a pleasure to speak to you all. So I'm Craig Skeldon, Business Development Manager at the Base Centre, uh, the University of Edinburgh, uh, and really I'm responsible for helping to build some of the partnerships at the university across data science and artificial intelligence across digital technologies like blockchain, quantum, 5G, IoT, as well as other areas such as space and satellite and robotics and autonomous systems. Um, and my background is really working in the innovation program space. So I've been in the university for over six years. I've also worked in Scottish government. And I've always been focused in roles where it's really about helping private, public and third sector as well as the academic sector to work together on projects, mostly consortium led around data science and artificial intelligence. Um, and my background, I'm non-technical is probably one of the things I would say is as somebody who works in the university. So I'm not a, a lecturer or, or a professor or anything like that. Um, but certainly my background is in business enterprise and, and innovation, um, as well as in design thinking and lean startup methodology. And so I'm very passionate about how we can work with private and public sectors as a university to help build ecosystems, to look at how we can actually equip people and equip companies with the skills, expertise, and the capacity to be able to drive that economic and societal growth. Um, and some of the ways in which we do that as a center, so the Bay Center itself is a relatively new building and a new program within the university. It's a couple of years old, but it builds on our strength in artificial intelligence from back in the 1960s as a university. And what we are is essentially an innovation hub for companies of all different shapes and sizes across different industry and market sectors. Uh, and what we're trying to do is build a, a local ecosystem in Scotland to support the growth of those digital technology areas, those frontier technologies that can drive some of that change in our governments and in our societies. As a university, of course, we are very, very large, we're very old, we're over 400 years old with over 45,000 students and 15,000 members of staff. Um, but things that are not that well known about us is our passion around entrepreneurship, for example. Um, so we've helped over the last 10 years to raise over a billion dollars into over 400 companies. Um, we work with industry, we're fourth in the UK in terms of our industrial engagement. We've done over 125 collaborative projects with industry this year alone. Uh, and we're actually top in the UK in terms of our own startups and spin-outs. We've helped create over 270 companies over the last 10 years. We've created over 68 this year alone. So we see that trend increasing and growing year in, year out. In terms of our role, and how we can help um, you know, with the change and adoption of these technologies within government and society. I think there's probably three core areas that, that I certainly have a personal interest in and I know the university has a personal interest in, which is around creating the, the new pipeline of talent, right? So universities, the traditional role is to provide skills and education to people, but actually going that next step and looking at, well, what are the skills that companies need? What are the skills that our society needs? You know, in light of COVID-19, have those skills changed? Is there a greater drive for autonomy? 
I think actually what we've seen is a greater demand for the the personal human uh, and the ethical skills, right? So companies want to think about why they're wanting to design algorithms or what the purpose of those are going to be. And so they maybe don't need a, a hundred more very bright PhD postdocs from computer science. They actually need social scientists. They need legal experts, people that have skills in those areas. The second area for us, of course, is research and innovation. It's a huge program within the university. We spend 90 million a year alone in computer science research as a university, um, probably across all of the different departments. You're talking in the region of four or 500 million a year. Um, and that's not unrealistic for a university of our scale. The important thing for us is that there is a change in academia where in the past it would have been very much blue sky research where publications are made and probably very very little impact is actually transferred into industry or into public sector and so i think there is a, a general steer from universities that they want to show how their research is actually making an impact not just in big large enterprises or global corporates but also in their local societies you know to to the communities and to the citizens that that we're very much a part of and the last area, certainly, that the Bayes Centre is focused on and, and I'm very passionate about is building communities and ecosystems. <clears throat> so in the Bayes Centre, we have over 30 companies. The majority of those are SMEs or startups. We do also have large enterprise partners. Um, but what we're trying to do is build an ecosystem where public uh, and third sector can share their challenges with those SMEs and large enterprises to think about the ways in which they can design these new solutions through frontier technologies. And as a university, we support that in a number of different ways. We can support it through research expertise. We can support it through our network of you know, industry partners across the world that might be able to help fund it. Uh, and most importantly, we have a, a great ability to be able to tap into our alumni network um, who can support the, the, the kind of expansion of these types of projects internationally. Um, I think the last point I'll probably say, you know, around around some of this before I pass on to others, is that in in Scotland and in Edinburgh specifically, we are part of a, a strategic UK government investment of over one point three billion pounds, um, and that is really to to drive data driven innovation in our region. Um, the rest of the UK does have a series of these similar regional deal investments. Ours is very much focused on data science and artificial intelligence. And with that, our aim over the next 10 years is to create over 50,000 new jobs in the region, to create over 400 companies in the region, to help train 100,000 people in data science related skills, and to drive over three billion pounds into the economy locally. And um, so certainly our ambition and our scale is to become the, the data capital of Europe, um, which might sound ambitious, but certainly based on the academic expertise we're already a very long way there. And of course, to do that, we need to bring our governments and our societies and our local citizens uh, on that journey with us. Uh, and so that creates a very interesting dynamic and a, a very interesting future of activities for us as a university. Right, um, fantastic. Thank you very much, Craig, for, for sharing that. Um, some, some very fantastic work the university is doing and hopefully um, we as a, a society and community start seeing, you know, kind of bearing fruits of, of, of all the hard work being done by uh, the University of Edinburgh and of course, you know, kind of others. Um, so uh, next uh, I'll pass on to Kohei uh, Kurihara. Uh, so he's the co-founder um, of Privacy by Design Lab uh, for him to introduce himself. Uh, sure. From my part, uh, let me share um, my presentations. Um, everyone see that this presentation this moment? So at the moment, yes, it's now just loading up. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so my presentation is uh, focusing on the my profiles and the backgrounds. I've been working on the hybrid the blockchain and data privacy field in this moment. Uh, this is now controversial this time to take in the balances, the new technologies and data side. So that's why I'm going to introduce uh, with these topics. 
uh, not just only for my background is my uh, issues and uh, try to challenge this moment. Um, so my name is Kohei. Uh, I'm based in Japan in Tokyo. I involve the uh, several uh, projects, especially uh, data privacy and blockchain fields so far. Uh, recently, I established a uh, privacy design lab. Uh, this is a not for profit organization in Japan. Uh, we lead uh, the, some discussions uh, with the uh, public sectors, the private sectors, uh, working together to deploy the uh, privacy preserving uh, concept, the compliances into the organization's operations. And uh, my background is a little bit uh, very broad, uh, such as I used to work in the particle sectors, education, businesses so far. So this is a brief introduction of mine. The Privacy Design Lab is the working on the very broad topics, not only for the privacy development, but also we support the uh, enterprises to use this concept into the internal operations because uh, privacy is not just the problems of the data, it's just a problem of the uh, uh, corporate management. So that's why I'm focusing on these areas. And uh, we try to cooperate with some public affairs, such as the Japanese government is working on this, some uh, the governance structures for the uh, corporate and the members. So we support those members to facilitate the, those processes. Uh, my agenda is uh, the component of four parts. The one is the data protection. The second is the compliances. Uh, the third is uh, I see the blockchain is uh, very uh, challenging at this moment, comply with the data protections. Uh, lastly, I uh, disclose the parts of the challenging for us. Um, maybe all you know the GDPR has been started the uh, two and a half year ago, since a lot of company needs to compliance with the data protections to deal with the data as an asset. So this is a very big topic for us. Besides, we see the similar reason working in California. This is also the very big impact for the tech companies to comply with the uh, protecting the consumer rights. Uh, this is a very strict to uh, coordinate the uh, data operations to restrict the third party data distributions to share the data. They also, we need the free consent of uh, consumer um, protection. So this is uh, very challenging for us. Besides, we see the very uh, big announcement that uh, data transferring into the multiple uh, nations is also the very big uh, burdens for us at this moment. It's just in the cost drivers. We have to comply with the uh, uh, the level of uh, data protection in each countries. Uh, this means uh, it's in a time to uh, to trade agreement in each uh, continent. So that, that's why that we have to commit the privacy first uh, in order to uh, make free comply with the, your technology into the societies. Um, from the parts that some company has started to transform uh, the operation, the interface uh, to the user experiences, such as the Uber has started more transparent uh, information providing uh, between the drivers and the users. This was a big problem as a uh, information asymmetries. Uh, this is the uh, uh, profit part for them but they have to uh, commit more transparent operations in order to provide accountability. And the uh, TikTok case, uh, they uh, try to commit the parents' uh, consent. Uh, this is also the strong requirements uh, in order to free comply with the data protections. And uh, kids uh, is uh, spending more time to use internet technologies so the data coverage is not only for the adults, uh, but it needs to be inclusive uh, for the young generations. Um, so that, that's why the data is a very key part of elements to uh, go successfully of the business. 
Um, so that's a trust is a very key. Uh, I've been working on the blockchain parts. The blockchain is the one of the trust makers, I believe, uh, because we have uh, some parts of the elements to deploy these technologies, the implementations um, to run their business onto the networks. So decentralized is the one way to prove uh, your corporations is more trust than the others. It's just in you know, strategies for the business operations. Um, so that's that's a lot of company needs to focus on the decentralized networks architectures uh, to to free comply the accountabilities or more transparent operation uh, for the data distributions. Uh, however, so we have uh, many challenges to comply with the uh, data protection rule based on the decentralized technologies. Uh, one is the responsibilities. Uh, who is the responsibility of the networks? So this is the one argument. Uh, we've been uh, conceived. This is the very primary things to comply with the uh, operations. Um, so a lot of company is uh, try to use the blockchain technologies under the GDPRs or anything. But the problem is, uh, on the networks and based on the decentralized, who is who is uh, mainly to control these networks? So this gonna be a uh, very uh, important topics uh, to facilitate those networks. Uh, beside the user rights, uh, I'm being involved in the uh, digital identity field so far. Uh, we have some concept the self sovereign. Uh, however, uh, on the networks. Uh, especially the blockchain is uh, having uh, some issues, such as it's it's not be uh, uh, easy to respond to the uh, data subject requests, such as the deletions, the rectifications. Uh, this is the requirement under the GDPR. But the problem with the blockchain is not the lines through the technologies. So we have to see those parts of the the issues to overcome to use these technologies uh, to deploy in the societies. Um, from my parts, uh, I've been involved uh, those things at this moment, and uh, I'm very happy to have uh, discussions uh, on these panels regarding those topics to deploy new technology into societies. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kohei. Some very interesting uh, pieces of work you're doing around, you know, kind of the data protection and how it potentially affects corporates and you know can kind of then the wider society so um it would be very interesting to explore some of those um uh yeah it, after you know kind of the introductions so um now uh passing on to edwin deander the cdxo and vp um of government and public sector at, at huawei and thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me and uh, it's really my pleasure to be part of such a, a team of stellar speakers. Uh, I am working in uh, Huawei head office, which is um, off the coast of Hong Kong in Shenzhen. Uh, I just returned from Beijing. I had a bit of issues in uh, logging on because uh, my home Wi-Fi is um, uh, a bit crappy. They're, um, they're creating a new service for me. So that's in the corner of my house. So don't worry about that if you hear anything in the background. They're, uh, they're uplifting it, so to speak. Um, I think Huawei itself doesn't need much introduction. There is a lot going on around us when you read the news and when you hear the news. Um, we're all over the news, I would say. So uh, clearly we're doing something good, uh, certainly when it comes to PR and awareness creation. Um, I work in Huawei Enterprise. Huawei Enterprise is one of the four strategic business units in Huawei, one of the youngest, but one of the four. Um, I'm not going to explain all these business units, but I am in the global government business department. We are the largest business department in Huawei Enterprise. And uh, the solutions domain that uh, me, myself, and, and my team look after is what we label smart. Uh, smart education, for example. Smart healthcare. Uh, safe, smart city. We don't say smart government for some reason, but we do have a govern e-governance platform that allows us to digitalize services and to bring those services back in a mobile in a digital form uh, to citizens and residents and people passing through uh, the residential areas and what have you and a smart transportation um 
I think the key point for uh, this particular panel that I think makes the most sense to highlight is a program that we have in place called Tech for All. Um, we see, and we I'm sure we all acknowledge that the world is driven by digital technology and we believe that no one should be left behind. So Tech for All is basically to digitally include uh, those who today don't have so much of a digital connectivity or a digital connection uh, because the world we live in is uh, filled up with a lot of people, but only half of the world has access to digital technology. Uh, some of the previous uh, speakers were also mentioning about knowledge gap. Uh, that's where this is tapping into. We try to empower the unempowered, so to speak. And we do this in uh, three focus areas. So from this program, we, uh, we bring this program uh, and circle this program around three focus areas. The first one, of course, sits within technology itself. Um, making digital technology affordable, available, uh, not only to regions who perhaps don't have it and need it, but also regions that actually have it, but have it sitting in silos. Um, a platform, for example, that is capable of bridging information silos and linking information silos is far much easier to go forward with and creates a stronger foundation than, for example, forklift upgrades, uh, migrations, or even complete replacements. A platform that overlays and bridges information silos creates a stronger foundation. The second one basically sits on the level of applications, not so much on our side. We don't develop uh, specific industry accelerating applications or industry applications. What we provide is a platform that has a lot of software inside that can use these different applications. So that comes down to the area of ecosystems, which was also mentioned by one of the previous speakers, including partnerships, for example, with uh, research institutions and universities, for example. And the last one in this uh, focus domain sits with skill sets. Um, we, don't own, we do not only work with local governments and communities, but we also work with organizations, uh, standardization bodies, uh, enterprises of all shapes and sizes in the different industry domains, and other partners to improve the uh, digital skill set of society. And this relates to four high-impact domains, as we call it. The first one, of course, sits with, um, with education um, to access to knowledge, uh, the distribution of knowledge, um, comprehension of knowledge, especially now with COVID-19, where uh, schools are closed, universities are closed. Uh, not only the uh, business people are forced to work from home, but also students are forced to learn from home and teachers in return are forced to teach from home. So a horizontal layer of digital mobile broadband technology that can link different services and different teams, including students and professors and teachers and what have you, is, um, is a high impact domain for us in this particular program. The other one sits with environment. If you look at how technology stacks itself up, you could say it's more electronics, it's more electricity, it's more electrics. Um, and yes, in some cases that is true, but in some other cases there are high-end innovations, for example, investments that we've done on our side that actually create solutions today that are lower on power consumption than the solutions that we had yesterday or the days before that or even the years before that. So if we would stack this all up, you could say that it's not only a digital domain that performs above industry standards, but it also performs at the lowest level of power consumption is available today to technology that is able to create that, so the environment. In return, uh, using um, elements like artificial intelligence, uh, big data analytics within specific platforms that can, for example, listen with sensors in the rainforest, for example, to understand whether perhaps somewhere in the middle of this rainforest, which is uh, not easy to reach, uh, for law enforcement officers, for example, or rangers, uh, but poachers perhaps find their way in. Um, so using sensor technology in rainforests or in harsh environments that collect information from the environment can bring it back to a big data analytic platform to help understand how the environment is affected or impacted and perhaps provide in return um, an analysis and insights in how to perhaps adapt specific programs and initiatives to overcome that, to recover from that. In the example of poachers or illegal logging, um, having an early warning system with sensors, uh, for example, in a rainforest, uh, allows uh, emergency response teams, but also uh, uh, le legislation and policymakers to anticipate on that. Uh, so the environment is not just 
a greener environment, but also an environment that is perhaps not so much digitalized, but serviced with digitalized technologies to create better insights and more insights. Another one, of course, is with health, healthcare, smart healthcare, telehealth, um, mobile health, uh, personalized healthcare, and so on and so forth. Uh, digital platforms, digital services allow the world of healthcare, which by nature is a very physical environment, uh, to also be supported with uh, information and information systems and services that, for example, help medical uh, medical teams. Um, another example, again, in the world of COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, using digital technologies to help fight it, for example, using digital technology like artificial intelligence to scan through vast amount of medical data faster and with a higher element of accuracy than medical specialists can do today. And we all know that because of the pandemic, our health systems already are under stress of more than they are uh, catered for. So if there is a digital arm or a digital brain or an artificial intelligent component that can help service that and create environments that makes it move faster and higher up the value chain at a higher level of uh, accuracy, for example, in determining and checking whether, uh, for example, medical image number one compared to medical image number two, three, number 2,000, number 5,000 shows differences in order to create a diagnosis is another example. And the last domain sits with um, development, um, economical development, for example, but also social inclusion. So to eliminate economical development gaps by encouraging entrepreneurship is also what's, what's been mentioned by, uh, by the gentleman before from the university, um, is something that we see very, very high up our interest. Um, for example, creating an educational environment that helps develop and bridge the gap of knowledge and that creates perhaps new jobs. Uh, there are many examples already that we're part of uh, that actually put this in place. I remember from yesterday earlier where Elise Cavetto in one of the panels, um, who is a writer of a book called Kick-Ass Attitude, I think basically what we're trying to bring to uh, this program is a, is a kick-ass attitude to, uh, to get this going. And we really look very, very, very much forward into not only uh, sharing these experiences in a panel like this, but also in um, finding and creating and leveraging the new partnerships that go along with it. And I'm, I'm more than happy to be part of that, uh, proud actually to be part of that. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much, Edwin. That is really helpful. Um, and some some very interesting work Huawei is uh, definitely doing uh, within this space. And um, uh, thank you very much for sharing that with us. So um, thank you, everybody, uh, for, for sharing all the, um, you know, kind of backgrounds and how you are involved in making an impact on the, the through technology on the world and so on and so forth. So I think now um, what I would like to do is um, I have, you know, kind of tried to pick some questions and themes and so on that at least, you know, have been jumped um, uh, at me personally. But uh, if we end up having any comments from, you know, kind of the viewers, uh, I will, you know, kind of try to bring that uh, at the forefront as well. And would love for, for any of you to, you know, kind of, uh, if there are any pressing questions, any pressing thoughts, et cetera, then, you know, let's, let's share them in a group discussion, essentially. Uh, <coughs> so I think first question, and Edwin has touched um, on that a little bit um, during his, uh, uh, when he was speaking. In terms of COVID, um, the pandemic um, obviously has impacted every part of the world, each one of us, and so on and so forth. So I would like to know, um, I think it, in two parts, um, the thoughts around how COVID-19 has actually affected the world from a tech perspective, because there's a lot of slowdown, there's a lot of you know, kind of potential job losses that would come about in different parts of the world and so on uh, and so forth, the impact on you know, kind of GDPs and so, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and people have, you know, kind of started segregating themselves uh, because of, you know, kind of protections and so on and so forth. But how do you uh, see uh, the impact of COVID-19 on technology from a perspective of whether it's accelerated uh, the use of technology or perhaps slowed down, you know, kind of things uh, and the impact of it on, on, on us? 
And you're asking yeah. it to all of us, or? So initially, I just wanted to, uh, you know, kind of for Edwin to respond, and then yes, absolutely, open it up to all of us. Okay. Well, on in our case, um, there are a number of things to to be said about this. The first one, of course, is uh, we already provisioned, and we continue to provision and keep up and running uh, mobile broadband infrastructures as as part of a global mobile broadband uh, supplier of technology that actually does that. And by the design of all these global networks, we we as an industry didn't really think that a pandemic would have an impact on a mobile broadband infrastructure. For example, a pandemic as we have now that says people need to work from home. You're not supposed to go to the office anymore. A residential area where mobile broadband connectivity is available is not designed for all the residents being online 24-7 at the same time. You can imagine perhaps for tech parks or, 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 or university campuses or other areas of, of a city, for example, or, or a province or what have you, that an area is designed for that, but probably a residential area not. And the uptime of all this and the burden that it brings to such networks uh, boosted on our side and burdened on our side our, uh, our engineering capacity, our maintenance, our services capacity, because we are responsible as an industry to keep all these networks up and running and to keep them available specifically to those who need it most but no one would have thought that when it comes to emergency response and critical communication that the medical industry the healthcare industry would be the 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 the, the largest industry today that needs it the most right normally in the design of these digital communication networks and broadband networks you think about, uh, I don't know, law enforcement, fire department, police, and what have you, right? They need to have 24-7 critical communication networks up and running. But now it is the healthcare industry. The healthcare industry needs to be online, digital, 24-7, because they are so enormously helped by digital enablement, uh, digital technology that allows them to do triage, or triage, however you want to pronounce it, which is the early check uh, lots of people are standing in line because they feel sick and they go to the hospital physically. But that's now exactly not what we would want them to do in this particular pandemic. We want you to keep a social distance. We want you to keep away from each other. Please do not come to the hospital because you might infect everybody else who is already in the hospital for also very severe issues, right? So a digital service layer that now in, uh, uh, arranges all that it, it, it is, is, is a tremendous... Um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it came as a, not so much as a surprise, uh, but it, it, it did come as, an, as, a, as a driver to step to the plate, get more engineering capacity, get more designers in place, but also a rollout and support uh, online and digital hospitals and the creation of online and digital hospitals. Uh, in China, there are examples where hospitals that didn't exist at areas that weren't even uh, 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 available yet were created almost overnight, actually, or fortnight. Uh, I, th I think the fastest one took 10, but uh, the, the average is between two and three weeks. But a physical location where normally nothing sits, where there's a big tent or what have you, and inside is so many digital technology available that wi within a couple of days, a completely digitalized and online hospital service is created. Uh, the third one, I think, sits with the knowledge creation, uh, knowledge handoff, knowledge handover, uh, the appeal that some governments in some countries have done, for example, to medical staff that has retired five, 10 or 20 years ago, perhaps, where they are asked, could you please rejoin because we need more resources in the medical industry predominantly. Um, but these people need to re-enter a, a space that they haven't been in for maybe 10 years or 15 years. So they need to learn what it is in this new way of working, in this digital way of working. So knowledge handoff as well. So there is a tremendous driver and a tremendous um, element of digital that is uh, both making it fantastic to be part of and both giving it a headache as well because how on earth are we are able to do this? <laughs> but clearly, clearly we are. Clearly we are. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank, thank you very much, Edwin. Uh, Amanda, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, apart from the... It's called the technical issues and, and bottlenecks that have you know emerged as a consequence of, of everyone you know being online all the time. 
I think those are temporary, right? I mean, we're going to solve them. Um, we're going to figure out how to do it better, and and things are 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 going to to work smoothly. But what I think is is truly transformational is is the fact that you know people are embracing you know the the digital economy at a much faster pace than ever before. And if you start off with just e-commerce, right, where it was already on on a trajectory of growth. Um, you can see in the last, you know, six to nine months that this has ballooned. You know, our, our grandparents are buying online. You know, <laughs> great grandparents are are using, you know, um, Amazon and other services. Um, and this means that you know more and more on-site physical businesses will will disappear. And in fact, I think a lot of the businesses that are uh, perishing as a consequence of COVID uh, will never come back. They will go, you know, completely online, and they will be, you know, focusing on digital commerce because it works, right? I mean, we're we're learning that it's convenient, it's easy, you know, for us to to shop and find everything we need, and you know, if it doesn't work, we send it back, all right? So, so there's there's a lot. There are a lot of these new sort of facilities, and because we're working in a in a service economy, it's going to make it easier to use digital technology. To do business, to to and also to do you know even healthcare, right? E-medicine will will continue to emerge as a as a way of avoiding having to physically go for a medical checkup when you know there are no sensors required or there's no blood test or or anything specific. So you you will manage to reduce traffic as a consequence of of embracing these technologies and these services. Um, and when it comes you know even to to our business, you know. We we're, we're in the we're in the information business, and and of course we've been digital ever since. But even through the pandemic, you know, we were quite as a company, you know, quite proud of of having a very united culture. Everyone sort of met together. We had team building exercises. We had you know summits and conferences. In fact, normally this week we'd have you know a couple hundred people in Marbella, Spain. Um, you know, playing, do, doing games, uh, going out, you know, having fun, um, meeting coworkers, right? Just to to build that that culture of the company, and and that's gone. So that is a very negative, I think, aspect of it, and that it's it's going to change it, and it's forcing us to create a more digital culture. Now, what that will look like and how that will impact us, I think, it's still very much to be seen. But we are social animals, right? And it's fighting against evolution. Uh, so that will be that'll be hard. I think we we had something similar when it I think it was maybe what 10, maybe 20 years ago when we talked about like virtual life and, and some of these sort of virtual environments. And uh, most people were saying this is it. You know, people will have, you know, a second life and, and they'll just emerge themselves in the Internet. But we all found that it was quite a, much more appealing to have a real relationship with people. Right. And and have a beer or sit down with friends and family. So that's still very much hip, I think, and, and I don't think it's going to go away. Um, and technology is just going to reinforce those areas of the economy and those areas of our lives where it's just not practical anymore. Um, and because of COVID, it'll force us to use some of these things, but we won't continue to use them because of the pandemic. I think we will continue to use them because they're just easy and simple and they make our lives better. Fantastic. Thank you, Armando. Um Absolutely, that makes sense. So just noting, noting, you know, kind of uh, the time we've got left. Um, moving on to some of the other um, concepts or, or thoughts. So, um, one thing that I would um, like Craig uh, to, you know, kind of shed a little bit of light on on how he has seen the private sector, the pub public sector, and the ac academia to, you know, kind of be actually working together. Because um, as we know that any adoption of technology, any influence, any change that it could bring bring about, it has to be, or, or it only actually happens once there's mass adoption. And there, I've seen many, you know, kind of different types of technologies come and go, different standards, because, you know, one company is competing with another and so on and so forth. So, um, and, and, and generally there are certain parts of, you know, kind of organizations or, larger organizations or certain parts of government that are, you know, seen as slow movers, you know, kind of working or adapting new technology, adopting new technology at a very slow, slow pace. 
So what are the challenges that you have seen in bringing these, you know, kind of different sectors together and how effective has that been in, in you know, kind of achieving the end goal? That's a great question. Uh, thanks for that. I think obviously the public sector and, and Edwin talked a little bit about that as well. The, you know, if you look at the, the, the medical side, health and social care in Scotland and the UK in general, the quality is exceptionally high in terms of international standards. Whilst the clinical care is exceptionally high, the ability <laughs> to manage their own resources and optimize their supply chains are incredibly inefficient. And I think what you see in some of those areas is questions coming back from people such as the NHS, certainly locally, you know, now doing webinars, how do we engage with the SME community? And those are questions coming from the NHS, which, you know, 10 years ago would, would just have been impossible. They wouldn't have been able to get through procurement processes. Uh, we're fortunate that we have a program called CivTech, which is a, essentially a program that allows SMEs to get some seed funding from public services and public agencies in Scotland and allows them to do pilot projects of their technology solutions in, in those different different areas. It could be healthcare, it could be around Scottish Investment Bank, could be around you know DWP, it doesn't really matter where, where that really sits. But what that's done is created an ecosystem where you know large government is willing to work with local SMEs and startups to try the technology before they buy it. And it's displaced and disrupted a lot of the large enterprise partners that would have traditionally have just expanded their, you know, their, their tender or their procurement with, with government. What it has done to large enterprises changed their attitude to working with potential startups, right? So a lot of large enterprises now have probably divested a little bit into their, their um, M&A activities and they looked more at how they can support SMEs through their relationship with their large clients to provide their SME technology to government. Um, and I don't think that's that's a massive change, but I think that you see in large enterprise wanting to support SMEs to help the government. And a part of the, the challenge I think that sits with government and, and, and public sector in general is they just do not have the cash to adopt the solutions that they need. Um, and I think that is the largest challenge that everyone's faced with. Um, how do you get public service provision that's extremely high quality if you can't buy you know, the solutions from the large companies that are providing them? And so what, what, what is interesting in the paradigm there, I guess, is for SMEs that have lower cost solutions that can maybe be more easily scaled locally in a very centralized area, you know, somewhere like Edinburgh with a population of 600,000 people, it's a very good testing ground, right? And if you get it right and it works, then you might see other governments and maybe across the US, across the EU or across Asia Pacific that want to adopt those solutions. Um, so I think that those are some of the challenges. Certainly, I think that an interesting point, probably not, not, not made earlier, is around the change of users in general, social appetite of actually wanting to engage with large enterprise, I think, is massively dropped. Um, certainly, it seems locally that a lot of people across the UK want to support local business because they understand the hardships that they're going through at the moment. You know, losing restaurants, the impact that that has on, on the well-being of people. And so I think, actually, there's there's a lot about digital enlightenment to support local businesses and, and, and local, local enterprise. Um, and certainly, you know, you've seen potentially adverts from Google saying, you know, use Google Maps, you know, give your local takeaway a five-star review, this will change their life. And actually, I think there needs to be a lot more effort made by a large enterprise to do that supporting of local local economy. Because if it doesn't, then a lot of the businesses in the UK, 97% of which are SME, will collapse. So I think those are some of the key challenges we've seen, certainly around automation and change. Fantastic. Uh, thanks very much, Craig. Um, absolutely. I think a lot of different challenges and we uh, as individuals and organizations and, and governments need to, you know, kind of keep on looking at how we, sh we can support each other to hopefully um, uh, deal with these challenges effectively and, and solve them as, you know, kind of time progresses. Um, 
One question I've got for uh, Kohi, um, even Armando you know, kind of touched on that a little bit initially when he was introducing, um, making the introductions around um, ethics and who's you know, kind of the, uh, the data controller um, in a particular decentralized environment. Because at the end of the day, the way I understand blockchain and decentralized environments are, while they are, they are trust makers, but at the end of the day, they still need to work with um humans you know kind of at the end somehow somewhere and so on and so forth so um systems can be automated but at the end of it there has to be uh some sort of uh oversight or you know kind of like you put it uh, data controllers and so on so what are your views uh of you know your company's views on how we should manage that challenge who should be you know kind of the the data controller whose ethics uh, we should be, you know, kind of looking up to and how do we answer, you know, kind of some of the challenges and how do we answer those challenges with, within this space? Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you for the great questions. Uh, so this is the uh, very big challenges for us because uh, from the uh, corporate side, they are not aware of uh, blockchain itself, right? I haven't talked to many corporations, not only in Japan, but the, also the other countries. Uh, besides not only for the com corporations, but also the some international organizations. Uh, they said uh, the blockchain is just a kind of the buzzwords. So they just understand in the potential technologies, oh, we say this will be the future standards. But the problem is that we didn't see any uh, practical approach uh, implementations. Uh, when we consider the free compliance with the uh, data protection, we have to uh, make a property uh, governance system. This is a key part of the area. It's a different from the centralized operations, such as in a cloud system, uh, the Microsoft, the Google, the Amazon is providing the services. This is the centralized operations. However, the decentralized against uh, the property management. So that, that, that's a very uh, significant to put the specific responsibilities then the extent of the coverage, uh, if any incident that happens, who should take on that? Uh, please imagine that once we see some ICO, we, which was just a kind of the non compliance of the fundraise through the uh, tokens, it was a many uh, big, big uh, fake project there. So the lot of the people is losing the money, losing the barriers. Uh, this was happens. Even they said, oh, this is a decentralized network, but actually it was not any practice. So this is a very big problem. And in order to make an implemented actions, we have to consider what is a practice, who is a responsible, who should take all the things then together. So the, the problem is happened now is uh, blockchain was a buzzword. But still now in the COVID-19, many project has been stopped because of uh, we didn't make any field things, in particular like a big supply chain networks, uh, it just been a shutdown. So the experiments has been stopped. So we have to reconsider what is the actual barriers of the new technologies, why you have to invest these technologies uh, for the effective management uh, to provide the best efforts. I'm talking with one IoT companies right now. Uh, they said this is their long time visions, but we have to consider which part is the best domains to start in a small. Uh, we had a um, very uh, big picture so far, but we have to focus on the uh, first step, the initial step. They also, we have to make an education. So what, what is a technical solution? What is a technical advantage? to choose a decentralized networks. So this is the, the my uh, my thinking uh, to implement the, uh, the those uh, responsible practice. Fantastic. Uh, thanks very much, Kohei. Um, again, uh, I have so many more questions and you know, we've got such an amazing panel with so fantastic expertise and skill sets and so on and so forth. But um, I've been told, you know, we've got only a couple of minutes left. Um, so, before wrapping up, just one word or one technology, if each one of you had to pick, you obviously, I think everything needs to work together to, you know, kind of make a difference, make an impact, make a change. 
But if we were to pick one technology, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, blockchain, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, which one do you think is the most important right now where we are at to make a, a difference? Just one word, Craig. Maybe not today, but tomorrow, quantum, 100%. Edwin. I see a huge uptake on the usage of artificial intelligence already now, very practically. Perfect. So Armando. AI, be it. Yeah, I mean, even before AI, I would, I would still say big data is, is it. Yeah, you know, we need to make sure we were able to get all this, all this data under control Perfect. first. Perfect. Kohei. Uh, I mean, involved in identity, uh, just the self sovereign identity is the key part of the element to back the lights to the users. Perfect. Um, I think personally, my view is quantum, I don't know much about, so I, I have to admit, um, that's why I can't, you know, kind of make a comment on that. Artificial intelligence, I think absolutely, but big data is a big part of, you know, kind of that goes into that. So all of that absolutely makes sense. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for uh, attending. You've been exceptional. And like I said, do you guys, your companies are doing some amazing work, you know, kind of the universities and so on and so forth. So please continue to do that. Um, thank you very much for whoever is, you know, kind of viewed uh, the, our, our session. And uh, hopefully we've, you know, kind of been able to entertain and at the same time educate and enlighten. Um, and thanks very much to Open Business Council um, and Cities ABC for organizing the summit uh, and giving us a platform to have this, this discussion today. So on that note, have a great day and uh, hopefully we'll keep in touch. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you very much to our panelists. It was a very great and inf insightful session. And I just want to remind you that we are being live streamed on uh, YouTube, Dinir Guarda, Periscope Twitter account at Open Business HQ, Facebook Open Business Council Group, Facebook Intelligent HQ Group, and YouTube Cities ABC channel. The next panel coming up is uh, the next panel coming up with us uh, is moderated by Simon Cockin, and it would uh, cover ecosystem digitalization, decentralized digital assets, DeFi, blockchain, and crypto. Uh, speakers that will join us would be Babak Bihbudi, co-founder and CEO, head of global operations at Synchronium, Mamadou Toure, CEO and founder of Ubuntu Tribe and Africa 2.0, Sergei Kitrov, founder at Listing Help and Jets Capital, and Peter Christensen, co-CEO, GP Fund Services. Closing up on this um, current panel, uh, as gentlemen were talking about, and they highlighted lots of different aspects, how frontier tech, blockchain, and AI can impact our societies. I would like to know that we live at the time of technological change that is unprecedented in its pace, scope, depth of impact. Of impact. Harnessing that progress is the surest path for the international community to deliver on the 2030 agenda for people, peace and prosperity. Frontier technologies hold the promise to revive productivity and make plentiful resources available to end poverty for good, enable more sustainable patterns of growth and mitigate or even reverse decades of environmental degradation. But technological change and innovation need to be directed towards inclusive and sustainable and sustainable outcomes through purposeful effort by governments in collaboration with civil society, business and academia. Change is becoming exponential thanks to the power of digital platform and innovative combinations of different technologies that become possible every day. This opens exciting possibilities for the democratization of frontier technologies to materialize in the development solutions. There are various strategies and action, some of them based on existing experiences in STI policy for the development, some more innovative ones to make technology an effective means of implementation of our common development agenda nationally and globally. The current uh, development of policies help people to navigate the transition period that lies ahead. This may require the stakeholders to adapt the social contract to the new world that frontier technologies are forming. 
education will become even more indispensable for the development of social justice. Since these digital technologies as enablers and multipliers on, of the frontier technologies should, should ensure all that, and especially women and girls are given the real chance to build digital capabilities. Lifelong learning will need to be supported. For those who may struggle to keep up with the transformations, countries will have to be innovative in providing effective social protection mechanisms. Uh, most crucially, there is an urgent need for sustained effort for the international community to ensure the multiple gaps in technological capabilities that separate developed and developing countries. Investment in hard and soft infrastructure and human capital complemented by a scaled up, coherent and accelerated effort to enhance an innovation system of sustainable development are necessary to spread to the economic, social and environmental benefits to the frontier of technologies. I now would like to share with you the film uh, made by Dinish Guarda and Open Business Council Studio about the blockchain. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone, and I would like to welcome you to our next panel.